um, repel the Germanic invasion invaders that were coming into the Roman Empire. Question. Yeah. Uh, could, could the Alps just be a confusion of the, of the name for Scotland, Alba? That's Alba. <clears throat> interpretation yeah. Uh, all the historians, um, they go through the, uh, the word Alps and Alpa means high places. You know, so it's it's just kind of a mountain. So it, it, it probably was not accurate. The the, the tradition uh, that he died in the Alps could have been uh, had morphed into that he died in a mountainy area in a high place. The the thing that's persistent about his death, and that all accounts agree, was that um, he was. A very powerful uh, leader, and he was on a, a very, um, what would I say, a, a journey of conquest, or at least retaining what he conquest, conquested, and that he was killed by lightning, and that they brought his body back. They brought his body back to Ireland, and they fought seven battles on the way back. And so the, obviously they didn't come back. It was a long way. Wherever they were, they had to fight their way back. Um, which, if you know the story of Alexander the Great, is a bit like that. You know, he went as far as he could go. He went uh, basically to the Ganges, you know. And uh, then he, he sort of, well, he got sick and he, he got... Well, probably malaria, who knows, but he almost died. And they, for, for all practical purposes, carried him back. But he was alive. Um, but he was, he, wasn't, he was no longer a, a fighter. But um, the actual retreat back through Afghanistan, back through Persia, back into... Uh, he never did make it back to Greece. He died somewhere, uh, you'd know. Yeah, in Turkey today, yeah. He died in the... In, in the Turkey land, which was yeah. Is that right? Yeah, he died there. Yeah, but it, it kind of reminds you uh, of um, what might have happened. He was that kind of leader, but where he was and how far away he was, <clears throat> we don't know. Except, as I said, that uh, that is beyond dispute as far as historians are concerned. Uh, if you can believe anything in history, that's one of the things is well documented. Um, but these things are. All, all of these interpretations are possible. It just depends on which one you prefer and which one you want to push. Um, whether you want to think that he was the, the Genghis Khan of the West and an Alexander and that he was an Irishman. And if that were the case, you can be darn sure that it got, it got rewritten pretty quick as soon as the English became uh, the dominant race. They <laughs> said, so we can't have this. <laughs> that became heavily redacted. You can be sure of that. But anyway, uh, tradition is very powerful in history, as most historians will uh, acknowledge. Um, so, let's starting at pushing it as far as you can go. Um, it is possible that he was and commanded a powerful army, um, and if you like, was uh, acting as the rearguard for the retreating Roman um, legions consolidating back into Rome at the early 400s. That's perfectly possible. And we do know that the Irish were on very friendly terms with the Romans um, as far as, as culturally through the Mediterranean. So uh, he would undoubtedly have been literate, surprise, you know, that would surprise a lot of people. He, would, he was not a savage. He would have been quite a... Uh, a literate and powerful man. We know that because of the laws. He was a lawgiver as well. But anyway, that's kind of stretching it. What I'm, I'd prefer to talk more about what we know about him uh, for sure uh, in Ireland and uh, what he represents, uh, the period he represents him, and how it enlightens um, his, his uh, life and his times enlightens us so much about what... Uh, the relationships of the different parts of Ireland and Scotland and Britain. So, <clears throat> um, his father was a raider before him. So, again, you can see how uh, 
with the disintegration of the Roman world in the end of the, towards the end of the fourth century, uh, it was an open invitation to uh, Irish chieftains who had the wherewithal to go over and do some uh, good honest raiding and uh, come back with what they wanted because Niall's mother was a Briton. You guys have been nodding ahead, you've been Carter. doing a little reading. Yes. Right? Carter. Yes. They probably brought you back. You're a pre really a Brit that was uh, from a raiding party. Kaharon. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and that again is uh, very well uh, acknowledged, pretty well undisputed, that um, his mother was the daughter of, um, of an English king. But now, here's what you got to understand. Um, these so-called slaves or uh, hostages that were taken back, they were taken back not just as booty. They were taken back as sureties of a, uh, a treaty that uh, he had secured with somebody else. And that's why I want to talk about what his name really means, Nile of the Nine Hostages. Um, now, let's, this is where language is so important. His actual name is Neil Nui Gula. So, Nui, as you probably know, who those of you who have been going to Irish classes, is nine, right? It's no, if you know, it's so much. So, Nui, that part of the word, Nugula, is easily understand. And so is Gila, if, for those of you who have been coming to this class for a long time, know that Gila, G-I-O-L-L-A, means servant of, um, or um, a subordinate person. And it has uh, nuanced meanings. It's not necessarily a, um, a gopher or somebody who's abused. Um, it just is. It's it. Rep, it means somebody who is subservient, subordinate to somebody else. Now, <clears throat> and it can be almost honorary in some places. Like for instance, uh, Gilaforic, Gilpatrick, uh, in English or Anglicized, is the servant of Patrick. Yeah. So, Mac Gilaforic, you know, so uh, would be a very honorary title. So to be the Gila to somebody important like Patrick would be uh, a, uh, an honorable name. Also, uh, the name Gilde or Gilajea, I've got a friend, uh, Gilde here, um, and his name obviously is Gilajea. In other words, the servant of God, uh, which probably was uh, some kind of a monk. They weren't always celibate, you know, Pat. Sorry to break that to you. <laughs> so there's, you know, mock, the mock of a bishop. It was that, that, and during that time was not quite normal. So, because um, celibacy was not exactly uh, honored. Uh, well, it wasn't part of the church, the early, the early Celtic church. So, mock Gila, J, or, you know, so, so the word Gila crops up a lot. Crops up a lot. And also, the word then the 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 giver of um, slaves or servants and the taker of slaves. so there's, there's two words on either side of that um, and the word for giving or the the, the is er a i a i r I'm not quite sure exactly but it's it's more or less it's kind of a verb so that if you say the ergela and that's a fairly common name too would be the subservient person who gives um, hostages is a better word than slave to another person and often would be again it would be something that would be done not necessarily uh, with a lot of angst but with a lot of glad that they were um, allied to a, a powerful king so that they would be an ergela and then there would there was whole tribes and people who were Ergelas or er, to uh, a larger king. So in fact, um, Niall, who had 
when it, now when you look at it in that light, you realize that it's not Nile who had uh, nine slaves tied up in his basement and went down and whipped them when he felt like it. You know, that's not what these servants, or that's not at all what it meant. It actually meant that he had nine subservient kingdoms. He had nine kingdoms that were subject to him, and each of those probably had many other subject as well. So that it was, it was a sort of a, uh, a, a um, it was like Nile of the nine countries that had nine possessions. Uh, so if you had a Nergala that was giving you hostages, uh, he looked up to you for protection, very much like the feudal system. And it's interesting, I don't know this, but I'm just guessing, 